Alrighty, so thank you very much for having me. Th huge thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to not give the same talk that everyone else has ever invited me to give, and for inviting me to give an entirely different kind of talk than I've ever done before. And in our 14 minutes and 49 seconds I have left, let's see how that goes. I also have to say, uh, because I have the great privilege of serving America's veterans as parts of the VA, that the VA and the US government and the Trump administration do not have any opinion about what I'm about to talk. And shockingly, I'm speaking as a private citizen. So much though I'd love to represent the Trump administration. And so if you have any concerns about US domestic or foreign policy, please find me at tea time, and I'll explain them in a coherent and rational way. <laughs> All right, so um, three stories and a little feedback. So in the first story, I'm gonna talk about a true patient with the pseudonym Miss Percy Jones and talk about why I became an ICU doc, met an ICU patient, and was utterly baffled. Then I'm gonna tell you about Dr. Liz Villianti. Peter just talked about gratitude. One of my great things that I'm grateful for is the incredible mentees I get to work with. And I'll talk about some of the work she's been doing to try to help explain to me who Ms. Jones was. And then in act three, I will talk about spending a year in Melbourne where the lovely Carol Hodgson and the brilliant uh, Ronaldo Bolomo uh, helped me understand the work Liz had done at a whole new level. And then I'll try to tell you what I think we've learned so far. So I became an ICU doc because I loved drama. I wanted to find that golden hour, that decisive moment where I could intervene and make all the difference and save people's lives. And I've been here long enough that I don't even need to ask you to raise your hands. Some of you out there had a similar attraction, that moment where you could inject and change the course of someone's life. And sometimes we can do that, and it's an extraordinary privilege of our job. But sometimes we can't. So this is Miss Percy Jones. This is actual summary from a sign out of mine. She's a 60 year old, previously well compensated cirrhotic who came into my unit with biliary septic shock after GI failed to make anything better and did an ERCP. And so we put in a percoli tube. Day two, her kidneys failed. We started CRRT. By day three, despite the fact that we were trying to run her in little negative, she was in fluorid ARDS. We intubated her. Day four, she had diarrhea. She had C. diff. Day five, everything's better. We're getting her off pressors. Day six, she's extubated. Day seven, we try to take down the CRRT. Next thing we know, she's back on high dose norepinephrine. This patient I suggest to many of you bears a certain semblance. As you sit there and look at that, and boy, I didn't want to see myself in the video. As you sit there and look at that, ask yourself, where's the golden hour? Where's that one pivotal moment where you're supposed to have fixed everything? Perhaps it happened up on day one somewhere and I just missed it, but perhaps not. So I said, how do I think about this patient? Um, there's somebody who's stuck in the ICU. Let's go to the literature. Are they a failure to wean patient? Are they our pink puffers and blue bloaters or anybody from the new wind classification or the prolonged mechanical ventilation? Well, no, because I've got them extubated already, so that can't really help me understand. And then we went in and started looking at the literature on chronic critical illness and asked, can uh, Greet Vandenberg's really elegant understanding of the endocrinopathies that occur among patients who are chronically critically ill help me? And I don't really routinely measure target hormone hormones or anterior pituitary hormones in my clinical practice. And so I confess I didn't find an obvious way to get from this to recurrent GI bleeds. There's a brilliant article I hand out every time I'm on service by Judy Nelson and Shannon Carson on chronic critical illness. And this notion again of people who have vent dependence, brain dysfunction, neuromuscular weakness, endocrinopathies, malnutrition, anasarca if they're in the US, a crap ton of pressors if you're in Australia, skin breakdown, symptoms, stress, exactly some of the people Margaret Herridge has talked to us so powerfully about. That also wasn't Miss Jones. I was stuck. I didn't know how to think about her. Every day I was just playing whack-a-mole yet again. 
the existing literature, the existing mental models I had were all about patients who were stably stuck in the ICU, who each day looked like the last. What I had, and I found that I didn't have just in bed 32 with her, but I also had in bed 20 and I also had in bed six, was the patient who every day was new. Every day they came in and we had to say, oh, what the hell did they do last night? And I was getting a little frustrated. I went on sabbatical, as Peter recommends. Sabbatical's a gorgeous thing. If you can get your boss to pay for you to be somewhere else not working for a year, I can't too strongly recommend it. I had the pleasure at that time of being invited by Carol to sit down next to her, and we were kind of brainstorming about what I should do while I was in Melbourne, other than try to learn how to surf, which didn't happen and did not go well at all. And Carol said, well, maybe we can make sense of these people. Maybe we could try to do some science on that. And so the next step was to try to recruit a young fellow. Uh, whenever I'm presenting work from one of my fellows, I'm going to try to put their name, and if they're on Twitter, Liz is not, despite a lot of urging, uh, up there on, so that you can actually see the people who are doing the work. And what Ronaldo and Carol and Liz helped us ask is, well, let's reformulate the question. How can we do some science on this? Are there ways we can ask among patients who spend a long time in the ICU, how common are these new late organ failures? How common do bad things happen after people are long outside of that golden window? And is it unusual? Was Ms. Jones atypical? Or was it just that I sucked? And that, that doing science in order to prove you may or may not suck is an interesting thing. I actually recommend it. So what Liz and Mike Schoding, uh, who is on Twitter up there, did is went through and pulled everybody who'd been in our ICUs uh, for at least 14 days, these people who were potentially this stuck in the ICU, and they went and used the SOFA score. We're not going to innovate here. We're going to count just like the good men of the sepsis or, uh, new sepsis definition told us to count organ failures and asked, how often do people experience new late organ dysfunction after day four? If we had more time, I'd, get, I'd try to pull you on this, but instead I'll just show you the data. That your average patient who's going to be stuck in the ICU is going to develop two new late organ failures, and this is bad, right? This is going from fine to high dose epinephrine. There is a little chunk of them, about 22%, who look just like the failure to weans. These people all came in with respiratory failure. They all went out on day 14 with respiratory failure. We could never get them off the vent. But in contrast, the vast majority of patients, 78% in this group of our single center hospital, um, looked like Ms. Jones. They had new problems each day and they cascaded. And so we started to get a sense that maybe the mental models I'd been given weren't enough. And we could try to think more deeply about who were these people who weren't yet the stably stuck. What did getting stuck look like? So, I went to Australia, and Australia has a whole bunch of virtues, but one of them is great thinking, and a second is a national database called the ANZICS Core Database. And in order to take this clinical intuition that there were Miss Joneses out there and do some science on it, we needed to find a way to formulate that question that's kind of nascent into a scientifically testable hypothesis. And this is what we came up with. We call it the persistent critical illness hypothesis. That there's a point in the ICU stay beyond which ICU admission and severity of the illness in the first 24 hours, the things we all anchor on, no longer differentiate patients regarding their probability of in-hospital death. There comes a point, to put a fine point on it, where you stop telling, where you interrupt the med student when they go, so this is Mr. Jones. It's day 14 of his ICU stay when he came in for alcohol ingestion. And you go, I don't care what he came in for. Get rid of that. It's no longer a useful part. Stop anchoring on who they were. But when does this happen? I've got guesses. Maybe it's day four, it's day five, maybe it's later. So what we did is we tried to take a million patients from the ANZICS data and divide all the variables that they'd measured about them into two different kinds. There were things that were acute characteristics. These are the things we really care about. Go into your Apache score, your admission diagnosis, all your physiology, whether you'd had an RRT, whether you'd had a cardiac arrest, how long you had to screw around in the ED before you could get an ICU bed. And then we took a relatively sparse set of like demographics and like eight comorbidities 
and we made each of them into risk scores. And then what we did each day is said, of people who are still in the ICU, which does a better job of predicting who's going to die? On the first day, your acute characteristics do a much better job. Let me briefly orient you to this graph because it's statistics. So on the bottom is day, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, out to 30. On the vertical axis is your ROC curve, as you all know and love from epidemiology and that beautiful three hours you spent in it in medical school. 0.5 is no different than chance. One is perfect prediction, higher is better. The longer people have been in the high ICU, the harder it is to predict who's gonna die. But on the first day, acute characteristics do a much better job than your antecedent characteristics. But by 10, Day 10, if I know your age and demographics and a little bit about your comorbidities, I can outpredict your mortality if I have all the physiology from day one in the world. And that seemed like a really potentially interesting way to define at a population level what persistent critical illness was. And there turned out there were very few of these patients. There were only 5% of an in the entire group who were there for more than 10 days. But they stuck around forever. And so these 5% of patients accounted for one third of, our of Australian bed days, that they were a huge amount of our work, even though they seem at first like a tiny little fraction of patients. Then we went to say, okay, Australia's awesome, but as many of the non-Australians of the room will announce, Australians are different than lots of other people in all kinds of ways. And so we wanted to make sure this was true of the rest of the world, not just some bizarre freak of having, you know, not, having to, not had a recession in 45 years. If you're from England, get your head around that. The Australian economy has grown every year for 45 years. We went to look in the VA, people in the US who's not experience continuous economic growth. And we found that the crossover point, the graph looks different, but the crossover point was exactly the same, day 11. We went to Scotland and found that same kind of graph, acute antecedent, crossover points about day seven, a little earlier, but the same pattern exists, that at some point, who you were before you come in is more important than the acute physiology that brought you in. And then Kathy Rowan, who you guys have all met, brilliant, did this entirely independently, finds that in the England, uh, Welsh, and Northern Ireland database, day 11's the crossover. Starts to look like there's a real thing here that happens all over the developed world. So what is this real thing if it's a thing? What do I think we know? So I think that there's a state that happens between acute critical illness and chronic critical illness. And it's this notion of persistent critical illness. If I were to offer a preliminary definition, it's that those patients whose current reason for being in the ICU is now more related to their ongoing critical illness and that cascade than their original reason for the ICU. Why does this matter? The first may be because we can try to understand the mechanisms. We don't know them yet. We're just getting started in this. It may be that it's just fundamentally random, that diseases fail and organs fail, it's kind of inflammatory storm, yada, yada, yada. It's just playing whack-a-mole. But it may also be that these human bodies are actually in the middle of sort of an unstable homeostasis. And if we can find a way to nudge them a little back, we'll be able to get them off this path. Or, perhaps most interestingly, there are actual structured failure modes that these things fail in a predictable sequence. And if we can understand that, we can identify targeted choke points where if we can prevent that complication, we can get them off the stage. We don't know what's going, which of these it is yet. Liz is still working hard on it, but this is kind of where we're thinking. In the meantime, there are at least two implications that seem to me pretty clear. The first is that we don't know crap about taking care of patients who've been in the ICU for 11 days. Everybody in this room has read multiple brilliant studies about patients and the resuscitation of septic shock for patients who came in and were triaged and randomized within two hours of coming in. 
I'm going to offer you, I think, a not terribly controversial hypothesis, that patients who've been under your care for 10 days probably have different physiology than people who've been at home not drinking Gatorade for the last 10 days. And so much of what we do in the ICU is we hope that their nth problem, we can just treat just like their first problem. We don't, I think there's little reason from an evidence-based medicine perspective to believe that's true, and I suspect there's little reason from a physiology-based perspective to think that's true. And we need to step back. For those of us in the US who really like our fluid resuscitation, I think that involves asking, if they're septic again, again on day seven, do they really need another 10 liters of fluid resuscitation? The Australians in the room are, of course, saying no, they didn't need 10 liters the first time. But think about what you do on day one and ask yourself, how might this be different after 10 days? Might they have started to tachyphylax to all those catecholamines you're giving them? And maybe it's a less useful. Explore those opportunities for what you should be doing differently. The last piece I want to end on is the question of anchoring. So, it's very easy when we're all incredibly busy to want people to become solved problems. Bed 32's failure to wean, I know I can come in there, I know I can let my trainee actually run rounds, I'm gonna flip through the Twitter and pay not much attention. In fact, if they're still in the ICU, there's a very good chance they're in the ICU for a reason. And we need to raise our index of suspicion about these patients and offer be much more open to the possibility that they're doing something new and stupid every time. I suggest the best evidence for this, and I'll end with this, is a little study from Andre Amaral out at Toronto, one of Margaret's colleagues. And what they did is they looked at whether patients who were cross-covered by their own team or by a different team at night did better. And what they found contrary strongly to their initial hypothesis was that actually cross coverage was good. The more often when you have a critically ill patient, you have someone different take a look at them, the less likely they were to die, even in a superbly high functioning unit like Stony Brooks. And this suggests to me that it's very easy to get comfortable with our di initial diagnoses, to get enamored of them, and to go off to that golden hour that's in the next room and pay a lot of attention to that while we let bed 32 languish. But they're still in your unit for a reason. You know that, and how to bring a fresh, open perspective to them each day is, I think, one of the challenges many of us face. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. These are literally ideas we're still playing with, and so if you think it's wrong or you think there are ways to nuance it, please shoot me a Twitter, a tweet, or an email. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jack. Alex, do we have questions? Yeah, there's lots of really good questions. Um, one in particular relating to our bias in rejecting patients referred to us on who they are and not their presentation. How does that fit in with your work, given the information we only get at that point is the acute physiology? Can I ask you to repeat the question? Because sure. I'm still trying to catch my breath from That's getting all on right. stage. <laughs> I'll read the exact tweet. Does your study confirm our ICU bias in rejecting admissions, admission of patients based on who they are and not their presentation? Oh, um, so everything you've heard from the last two days suggests that whatever I tell you, you're going to think it confirms your bias anyway. I would say, um, I don't think so. I'm increasingly interested in time-limited trials. I think it's often very hard for me to tell who I'm going to make better, and that actually nothing does so well as a good 12 to 48 hours of resuscitation antibiotics. And in the grand scheme of things, in part because I work in the US where we have a lot of ICU beds, I would much rather try to make someone better and see if I do than guess up front whether or not I can make them better and just be sure I'm right because I'm more fallible than that. A last one, uh, Alex. Um, what do you think, should we be using population data to model individual patient management? Uh, yeah, I'm an observational data guy. If we don't do that, I have to be out of work. So I think the answer is, um, as in everything, 
uh, any form of generalized knowledge, whether it's your dog lab physiology, your population-based based data helps craft your prior probabilities and your sense of what's going on, which you should then also let repeated interaction with a patient help tell you if they're doing something different. I think there's a role for population-based data in informing your best guesses to what's going on, and there's a role for looking and saying, huh, I'm wrong, this is something different. Thank you very much, Jack.